Hello and welcome everyone to the Monday Morning General Podcast, where we give you the play-by-play and analysis on battles from antiquity to the 20th century. I'm Brendan, that's Bjorn, let's get after it. So Bjorn, today, we are going to be talking about the Battle of Hastings, and specifically, what led up to the Battle of Hastings in this episode. Next episode, we'll get into all the tactics at Hastings, and I think we might throw a little special uh, bonus battle in next episode, so stay tuned for that, but yeah, Hastings, let's do it. Yeah, so... This is this is the the prelude to this episode is going to be pretty important in that we need to ensure that the listeners are able to grasp the political uh, ramifications, all the the different jostling for positions because this isn't just a one v one one guy versus one other guy battle. This is a this is a almost a three way um, for the throne mm-hmm. of England. Yeah. So let's give a quick overview. So the Battle of Hastings was fought in October of 1066 between the armies of William, Duke of Normandy, and Harold Godwinson, the King of England. The battle was fought near the town of Hastings in southern England and marked the culmination of a power struggle between William and Harold over who would succeed Edward the Confessor as King of England. So yeah, this thing, it does come down to a a succession battle and who is actually going to be the crowned king of the island of Britain. And then when you look at it, the end result is a result that has lasted for a thousand years. No, it's more than that. All right, Bjorn, so this battle had a huge impact on English history, obviously, and I think also uh, some impact, at least on the continent as well. And it was probably one of the most pivotal moments in English history. It marks the end of Anglo-Saxon rule in England, and it's the beginning of Norman rule. We're seeing a lot of French influence now being put into into England now. Right. Well, and, and a real quick history of England before 1066, you have the original... Celts and the Picts and all the, and then you've got the Romans show up, then you've got these, the Germanic tribes, the Anglo-Saxons, you've got Scandinavians. The history of England prior to 1066 is one of many different Mm -hmm. cultures rowing their boats or sailing their boats across the, the channel and finding a place to live, farming, raiding, pillaging. And then all of a sudden the Normans, who I very, very much like to remind people that Normans were actually Northmen from Scandinavia originally colonized the area by a guy named Rollo, and uh, and he's actually of you know Viking okay. heritage. If you can't beat them, join them. That was kind of the the mentality of the French at the time. And since the French were having such a hard time defeating and defending against the Scandinavian Viking raids, they said, "Hey, why don't we just give this land to some Vikings and they can then defend themselves against themselves. And it actually turned out to be an excellent defensive strategy for the French. But at the same time, the North men turned into the Normans. And so, you know, someday someone should write a book about how the, the Vikings and the Scandinavians conquered the world, because let's be real, the Normans were North men. Uh, So before, 1066, England was pretty isolated as a country. Culture and society were defined by its Anglo-Saxon heritage with the ancient Britain and then the Romans also part of there, but it was very Anglo-Saxon at the time. And then on the other hand, the Normans, very cosmopolitan, uh, they'd adopted many of the cultural and intellectual traditions of the broader European world uh, because like Bjorn said, they did descend from Vikings and the Vikings were known for traveling all over the place, raiding and also bringing in culture and goods from other places, languages. So that was a big thing. Uh, So England becomes less isolated. When the Normans conquered England, they brought with them a brand new language, a new legal system, and a new social order. They introduced the feudal system, which gave rise to a new aristocracy and a highly centralized monarchy. And they also established Norman French as the language of the ruling class, which had a profound impact on English language and culture, as we can see today, uh, learning English is very difficult for uh, English as a second language speaker. Uh, It's very difficult for English as a first language speaker to learn. I I still can't spell. You can't. (laughs) The other interesting thing here, too, is that centralized monarchy, because before, you know, England was a mixture of five different kingdoms before the Anglo-Saxons came in. But the Anglo-Saxons never really created that centralized monarchy that we think of with, like, France and then later eras of the English monarchy. And it was very much disjointed. There was a central king. But the, think Northumbria, think Mercia, yeah, Mercia. those are still very large um, parts of that English kingdom that had a lot more influence. And then that goes away after the Normans take over. Right. And you've also got yeah. Wessex, you've got Wales, all these different areas. And, and the Wittingen, 
which is that council that create, you know, it's not, not necessarily a hierarchy in which you have a child and that child's then made the king or the queen. Uh, this is, you know, it, it does become that in mm-hmm. some instances, but they still have this sense of independence, these, these leaders of, you know, I don't know if they were, they weren't necessarily dukes and duchesses. That's more Norman right. style, but these leaders, They're, it's more warlords have, and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And they have influence and they get to say, and they proclaim who their king is and whether they just do it for show and say, yeah, the son of the old king is now our king. They mm-hmm. still did that. They had a sense of independence, which then makes your, your actual leadership. It kind of, uh, you know, it, it makes mm-hmm. it less strong. It's not a strong okay. leader. Compared to like, if you look at France at the time, you know, this was after the Carolingian Empire, but you have to think back to like Charlemagne the Great. And, you know, he was like the successor to the Roman Empire. And, you know, he's got all the authority of the papacy proclaiming him to be the king from God. And England didn't really have that at the time. And they'll start to get this, you know, after William conquers England. Uh, next thing to note, huge impact on the military history of England as well. The Norman victory was due in part to their superior tactics and equipment, which they had honed through years of warfare on the continent. The English army, by contrast, was still relying on the shield wall, a tactic that worked really well from the past, but was now becoming more ill-suited against the kind of mobile cavalry-based warfare that the Normans used. So we're going to start seeing more horse and archers being involved in English military as well. And we're going to see a huge kind of amalgamation of different types of equipment. We're going to have vast disparities in what soldiers are bringing into battle. Even on the same team, you're going to have very heavily armored versus very lightly armored individuals, very technologically advanced weaponry versus very yeah, primitive primitive things to the point where they're throwing rocks at each other almost. So just to wrap up this little section on the impacts, the Battle of Hastings, very significant in English history, marks the beginning of a new era in England. Uh, which transformed the island from relative, relatively isolated uh, Anglo-Saxon society into a cosmopolitan Norman-dominated culture. Uh, the impact of the Norman conquest of England still felt today, and it continues to shape the country's language, culture, and institutions. So that's the that's kind of the, the impacts that we're going to have after the battle. But let's talk now before the battle, leading up into it. So there was this is an interesting one because a lot of times you almost see like one army or one king facing off against another army, another king, another leader, or general. And this one, there's a lot of dudes we need to talk about. And so we thought for this episode, it might be better for us to lay those people out at the front end just to get people acquainted with the leadership that the people are going to be talking about. So there's four that I want to talk about. The first, William, Duke of Normandy. Uh, he was born in Filet, Normandy around 1028 or 1029. And he inherited the Duchy of Normandy at the age of seven. He is known to be ambitious and intelligent as a young man. Um, Known for his astute political skills and his military leadership, he won numerous battles and campaigns in Normandy and beyond. And then William's early years were marked by political turmoil and warfare as he struggled to maintain his power in a region frequently torn by conflict. Despite these challenges, he emerged as one of the most formidable figures of the medieval period. Now, when we're talking about William, I I want to stop and talk about nicknames. You know, nicknames, they have a meaning, they have a purpose, and they're derivative of, of different areas of life. Now, William had two big nicknames. Now, the one that he basically died with was the nickname of William the Conqueror, which basically is a foreshadowing of what occurs during this battle. You know, he conquers. That's a nickname that he earned later on in life. His original nickname was one in which he was very much unhappy about. It was bestowed upon him. His nickname was William the Bastard, because William's father uh, actually, uh, he, you know, William's father was a duke, William's mother was originally a tanner, and so there are stories of there there are stories of uh, of William's military career in France at the time in Normandy, and there was one instance where he got pretty pretty angry when he was taunted by his enemies when they were beating on uh, leather. Basically, these dudes made their own drums out of leather as a slight against him, saying, "You're nothing but a tanner's." son you are right. nothing he actually like he when he when he captured that city he actually like dismembered those individuals and destroyed them for it so do not get william the bastard angry by calling yeah. him a bastard okay. don't do it all right that's a word to the wise there but then look at the the part where he inherited the duchy at the age of 7 
Now that is a very dangerous time for oh, a kid and their their hierarchical title that they've received. You know, he you know his father died. Uh, he was actually they they swore an oath. All the all of the, his dad's kind of uh, right. henchmen they swore an oath to him, their fealty to William as his dad was leaving to go on crusade he was going to go off on a pilgrimage to the to the you know middle eastern areas and so he was going to be off on a long trip he ends up not coming back 1035 is when he dies age 7 william becomes the duke of normandy and so he grows up understanding the political mm-hmm. atmosphere and he becomes incredibly good at ensuring that his people remain his people and stick with him because at the age of seven, there's a lot of betraying. There's a lot of, he actually, uh, there was an assassination attempt on his life that was thwarted, but this guy, he's an intelligent man and he knows what he wants and he's going to go get it. All right. Uh, Next leader, Harold Godwinson, Earl of Wessex and later King of England. So Harold Godwinson was the Earl of Wessex, one of the most powerful and influential men in England in the 11th century. He was born in 1022 or 1023 to the uh, to Godwin, Earl of Wessex, and Godwin's wife, Githa Thorkel's daughter. I think that's how you say it, Thorkel's daughter. Uh, and then, so Harold's rise to power closely tied to that of his father. Uh, his father was a trusted advisor to the English king, Edward the Confessor. When Harold's father died in 1053, Harold inherited his titles and estates, becoming one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in England. Harold was known for his military prowess and his shrewd political skills. He played a key role in a number of military campaigns and diplomatic negotiations and was a trusted advisor to King Edward. When the king died in 1066 without an heir, Harold was elected as a successor, but his reign would be very short-lived, BR. Here's the thing about Harold. Now, Harold understands the political atmosphere. He knows that there are other individuals jostling for this throne. And so upon his you know, election at the Wittingen, he knows he needs to initiate movement immediately. So this guy is also an incredibly intelligent individual who had fought battles throughout the entirety of his adult life. He's good at what he does, but he also knows that as soon as he took control, as soon as he took over as the King of England, he had to initiate movement. And we're going to see that later on here. The next person we need to talk about is Harald Hardrada. He's the King of Norway. We'll say here, the last of the Vikings. Uh, He also had a claim to the English throne. Harold Hardrada was born in Norway in 1015 and became a legendary warrior and military leader. He served in the Varangian Guard, an elite unit of the Byzantine army, before returning to Norway and claiming the throne. In 1047, Harold became king of Norway and embarked on a series of military campaigns, conquering vast swaths of territory and establishing himself as one of the most powerful rulers in Scandinavia. He was also known for his personal bravery and his skills as a military tactician. I think that's so awesome that Harold Hardrada was... Uh, a member of the Varangian Guard. That's one of those elite Byzantines. So for those who aren't aren't aware, Byzantium, that's where modern day Turkey is today. And he's coming from the Scandin- the Scandinavian countries. He's up there in Norway. And that's how extensive the traveling of the Scandinavians were during this time period. They went everywhere. They were in England. They were in France. They were down in Rome. They sacked Rome at one time. They're down in the Middle East. They're over in Russia, the Rus, the Red Men. Those are Scandinavian by descent. They're just everywhere. And so here's another instance where we're going to see uh, a Norwegian moving in on this throne. But, you know, there's two other individuals, and I'll kind of break in here. The two individuals who also had a claim to the throne, uh, there was an individual whose name was Edgar Flinging. Yeah. And uh, this individual was the son of of uh, an individual from Hungary, but also the grandson of a guy named Edmund Ironsides, who at one point in time was a relative of someone else who uh, was at the time a king, all right? So he also was playing in the game, but the problem was is although he actually had a pretty a pretty tight claim with his hereditary, her, the hereditary claim, he was only 12 years old. So he actually didn't have the backing of the individuals who would have been able to set him up as king. Uh, and then there was another one, uh, a guy named, uh, let's see, Magnus of Norway. Oh, an old Norwegian. Uh, there, was a, there was a, yeah, there's a story of a guy named Magnus of Norway and Hartha Canute, two individuals who had made a pact 
that said if one of them died childless, then the other would inherit that the 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 individual's territories. Oh, that's, okay? that's the same claim that but, Hardrada has. Harold Hardrada. Has. Yeah, yeah. So then we see another thing here. There's a the Danish king whose name is Svein Ethrensen, yeah. and he was threatened by Norway, uh, and so as a result of that, he is not going to push forward his claim. And he was the nephew of a guy named Knut who had been the, the king previously, but he's not going to move forward because he's threatened by Norway as he's the Danish king. So there's some individuals who are looking at this geopolitical scene and they're saying, well, you know, I have what I have. I don't want to threaten a loss of what I currently have to try and overextend. You have a 12 year old kid who is who doesn't have the political backing, even though he may have the hereditary backing. Uh, but there's a couple other individuals who could have played this game but just were not able to kind of rally the forces or didn't have the desire to uh, either. Uh, but going back to Harold Hordrada, the Norwegian guy, he had someone on his yeah, team, he did. right? Uh, and that someone was actually pretty important. Uh, his name was Tostig Godwinson. He's Harold Godwinson's a strange brother. Uh, and he allied with Harold Hardrada. Tostig was the younger brother of Harold Godwinson, Earl of Wessex, and served as the Earl of Northumbria from 1055 to 1065. He was known for his heavy-handed rule and he was extremely unpopular with the people of Northumbria, uh, which ultimately led to his exile in 1060. And he blames that partially on his brother, Harold Godwinson. Okay, so Harold Godwinson, the king of England, is the brother of Tostig, who is going to become the ally of Harold Hardrada, right. the king so of Tostig, Norway. Uh, we'll talk about like the claims and all these guys' claims. Tostig doesn't make a claim to the throne, but he sees Harold as a way for him to reestablish his control of Northumbria. So he's trying to ally with Harold Hardrada so that he can come out of exile. Basically, is what's going to happen. Come out exactly. with some form. Right of now, power. he's like he's like either in the Bel in, in Belgium or the Netherlands, uh, just kind of hanging out because he's he was exiled away from England. All right. So we should talk about why the battle actually happened. And this one's actually pretty cut and dry. Edward the Confessor, uh, King of England, dies, and there is a succession crisis. No one knows who's going to be the king, and there's a lot of conflicting claims to that throne. And we are near to kind of, you talked about two of them right now, but let's talk about William's claim. So William claimed that he'd been promised the English throne by King Edward the Confessor, uh, who had no direct heirs, and that Harold Godwinson had broken this promise when he was crowned king instead. So William says that Edward the Confessor promised him the throne. Harold Godwinson claimed the throne had been given to him because he was elected by the, how'd you say that? The, I, I have, with Tengablot? Yeah, the Wittingen. Okay. Uh, that's a council of nobles and bishops after the death of King Edward um, and he had the support of the English people. Uh, he had been in English politics his whole life for the most part, uh, and so the English people were supporting Harold's claim to the throne. Then there was Harold Hardrada. Uh, he claimed that he had been promised the English throne by King Hart the Commute, uh, the previous king of England before Edward the Confessor, and that he was a rightful heir to the throne through his bloodline. So we have three strong claims to the throne here, and all these men also have backing of armies and ships and money. And in, in, in the end, that's the only... That's the only claim that matters, right? You could you could be the legitimate heir without an army. Or you'd be 12 no and who's going to follow a 12-year-old. A lot of people do in this time frame, but uh, yeah, can the 12-year-old bring armies to the field? Do they have the money to support any sort of invasion and the preceding conquest that it's going to take you know, to keep an army in the field? Not many 12-year-olds do. Uh, so these three men have the claim and they have the resources to support that claim. So here's what happens leading up to the Battle of Hastings. So let's talk about Edward the Confessor real quick. He was the previous king of England. Uh, so Edward the Confessor was the son of King Athelred, the Unready, and was born in 1003. He spent much of his childhood in Normandy and returned to England in 1041 to succeed his half-brother, Hartha Canute, as king. So Edward the Confessor spent a lot of time in Normandy in William's father's court, right? Uh, that's where that relationship was built between Edward the Confessor's Englishness and the Normans. Now, just a real quick comment on his on Edward's dad, King Ethelred the Unready. Uh, his original nickname was actually his name's King Ethelred the Second, who is nicknamed the Unrad, which is a term that means bad counsel. So that's not really a good nickname to have. But then they later kind of botched his nickname to be Unready. So originally it was Ethelred the Bad Counsel. And then it turned into Ethelred the Unready, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. 
But then the, the crazy part about it is that Edward is going to spend, as you said, most of his time in Normandy as a child. So there has to be some form, like it was a decent right. growing up, right? Yeah. He was taken care of. And this he was very com- this was very common at the time, right? At- to send your sons to another court to solidify the relationships, and you know it's the same thing like you marrying your daughters off and marrying your sons off to like secure land and that sort of thing. So this is another one of those things where you send your children to another person's court to solidify ties and build a good relationship. And that was really I think Normandy's so right across com- the English Channel. It's a really strong ally to have on the continent. So it makes sense that Edward would be in Normandy to kind of build those relationships. Yeah, and that that he would think favorably of his time there and have decent relationships with other heirs of the area and and William being one of them. So it seems like a a legitimate conversation when William says, hey, I was promised this. So Edward was known for his piety and his patronage of the church and was canonized as a saint after his death. He also presided over a period of relative peace stability in England, which was disrupted by his death and the ensuing power struggle for the throne. The death of Edward the Confessor in January of 1066 marks the beginning of this political turmoil in England as William and both heralds start to make the claim to the throne. And William almost begins immediately to assemble his army. Uh, this happened in the spring of 1066, shortly after he learned that Harold Godwin said to be crowned king of England. Uh, it took several months for William to raise and train his troops, as well as to secure ships he needed to transport his army across the English Channel. Well, so in, in the summer of 1066, Harold Hardrada, the guy who's got the, you know, his brother's got a, a grudge, yep. right? Tolstig yep. is the Tolstig guy with the grudge. It. So Harold's going to reach out to Tolstig. And they're going to formulate an alliance in which eventually they're going to invade in northern That's England. Right. Yep. Isn't so that correct? Together, Harold and Toasty gather a large fleet of ships and an army of about 15,000 men. And that's a pretty big army for this time. Uh, that's a lot of dudes to bring to the field. So they sail from Norway to the Orkney Islands and then to the city of York in northern England where they landed on September 18th, 1066. One thing that's interesting about this, Bjorn, is that that is where the Vikings initially landed uh, back in the 800s uh, to start their conquest of Northumbria as well. So that was, they landed at York, and then from there they moved up into uh, into Northumbria to kind of, and they, they killed all of us, the leaders of Northumbria. So that's another interesting thing about the Vikings. So they like landing at York, uh, and they defeat uh, English army at the Battle of Fulford on September 20th, 1066, and then they move south towards the city of Stamford Bridge, where they intend to confront the army of King Harold Godwinson. And English army might be the wrong word to use there. It's probably like, you know, an English levy uh, that gets stood up really quickly to deal with uh, this invading Norwegian. Uh, but they're they're conquered pretty quickly at Fulford and then move over to Stan, uh, to Stanford Bridge. Uh, the Norwegian army, yeah. Well, for sure. There, there's no way that 15,000 men lose to the right. feared, you know. The feared are basically any noblemen who are in the area who own land in the area, have their noblemen that they, you know, they have a couple hired hands and then everyone else is just a bunch of farmers who get called up to defend their homeland. So 15,000 trained Norwegians against a whole bunch of untrained yeah. uh, Anglo-Saxons, they don't have a chance at that place. So it really all depends at this point on the raising of trained armies and the assembling, the actual assembling of, right. of fighting men. So let's talk about that. So after Harold Godwinson is crowned king by the, how do you say that again, Bjorn? The Wittengen. The Wittengen? Not how it's spelled. <laughs> All right, so Harold immediately begins to assemble and train his army to defend the kingdom. His army consists of both professional soldiers, also called house, house girls, and his conscripted levies, uh, the feared, from across England. He initially stationed forces along the southern coast of England uh, to defend against the invasion uh, from Duke William of Normandy who had like claimed to the English throne. So he knows that William is raising this army. And so Harold puts his on the English channel to prevent any invasion. He also made effort, efforts to improve the count, uh, country's defenses. So he starts repairing and fortifying castles and constructing defensive structures or birds, such as trenches and barriers. So we have all three of these men in the spring and summer of 1066 preparing armies, and then Harold got us at preparing defenses against invasions, uh, both from the south in Normandy and then also in the north from Norway. Well, and what's really interesting is that Harold absolutely knew what was coming, and he knew that there were two armies that were assembling against him. Uh, as soon as he takes control of, of England, make, becomes the king, like I said before, he immediately begins moving towards 
ensuring the defense of this of this country but also he moves north in order to solidify his his loyalty and his standing with some of his new leadership up there because remember his brother is now out of favor in the north and so he's going to move up there he's actually going to discard his wife and he's going to get married to another one up in the northern portion i think it was northumbria or mercia uh, one of those individuals, he marries a woman from up there in order to yeah. solidify, kind of tie in the loyalty of the individuals who are living in England at the time with the noblemen there and and ensure that he's going to have that sort of loyalty and backing as he prepares to defend against these Norwegians and these Normans who are coming and they're coming soon. And so good on him for the movement he's doing. It's actually impressive what he's able to accomplish and when we go into the next episode here we're going to see how he fights because he's going to fight two battles in rapid succession he's going to ask his military forces to perform acts that are not really plausible or able to be performed by random armies at the time so it's really impressive what he's going to be able to accomplish and what he almost right. pulls through and it's just by strokes of luck potentially that he loses this in the end but that's that's kind of a a hint to give away for the next yeah. episode so that's where we're going to leave off bjorn so we have english norman and norwegian armies preparing for battle uh you know harold's on the southern coast of england right now william's on the northern coast of france and harold has just landed at york and is moving into the english countryside so thank you so much for listening everyone be sure to subscribe and tune in next time to hear about the details of the battles of Stamford Bridge and the Battle of Hastings. We got a two-parter next time in the same episode. Two battles in one. I think that's all we got, Bjorn. We'll catch you guys next time. Bye.